Well, thanks very much, Steve, for leading us um, and for reading out uh, that psalm so so eloquently and movingly. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Ralph. I'm one of the leadership team here at City Gates, and um, I have this privilege of looking at this psalm with you tonight. For the next three Sundays, we're looking at the person and work of Jesus through three consecutive psalms. Psalm 22, 23, and 24. And our theme, because of our, the brilliant alliterative skills of Alex, uh, is going to be the cross, the crook, and the crown. Uh, so Psalm 23 next week, we're going to look at the crook, Jesus as our shepherd. Psalm 24, the week after, Jesus as our king. But tonight start with Psalm 22, the cross, Jesus as our suffering saviour. Let's just take a moment in prayer as we begin this. Our Father God, we recognise that what we're looking at tonight is something that's quite brutal, is deep, uh, is speaking of, of immense suffering and anguish, and we know that there are, maybe there are some here tonight who feel that. We pray, Lord, that you will help us learn from your word as we look at this together and see uh, the beautiful thing that our Savior has done for us. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. So please keep your Bibles open at that psalm as we work through it together, and I'll put up other verses that we're going to cross-reference with um, on the screen. Now, as you read it, as you heard it, Steve, read it to you, I guess... There's probably two potential reactions you had. If you're not a Christian or you're new to Christianity, you might be thinking, what's that all about? Someone desperately suffering and in great pain, they're pouring their heart out in anguish and complaint to God. And then suddenly halfway through, there's a dramatic change of heart and we're praising God for what he's done. And if you're a Christian, um, you will probably recognize that this psalm speaks vividly of events which were going to happen a thousand years after it was written because this psalm is a prophecy. The recorded here are minute details that predict what will happen at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And this evening our focus is going to be primarily on this psalm as one of the best known prophecies of Christ's suffering on the cross. So what's it all about? As they say, let's go figure. We're going to look at the psalm through these points. A thousand years before the cross. The prophecy of the cross that we see in the psalm. The reason why the cross. The infinite love and agony that we see at the cross. And the victory of the cross. So those are our headings that we're going to go through. First of all, let's look at what it meant for the readers of this psalm before the time of Jesus. Now, if you read the beginning there, there's an introduction. And in the introduction, we see that it's a psalm of David. It was written by Israel's second king. He reigned 10, uh, 1010 BC to 970 BC. And he was a man who was flawed and sinful. But his heart was devoted to God. And David's life is recorded for us in the books of 1 Samuel, mostly 2 Samuel, and at the start of 1 Kings. And David we see as a type of Christ. That is, he's a person, one of the people in the Bible who points towards Jesus and his future work. When we read of characters that we see like that, we're, it's preparing Israel to recognize Christ when he comes and understand what he'd come to do. Now, for many years, David was persecuted. He was hunted down by Saul, Israel's first king, who turned from God and lost God's blessing. And David became anointed to be Israel's king, and so Saul had it in for him. Now, we don't know which actual event in David's life he might be writing of here in Psalm 22. And in fact, he may actually only be concerned with foretelling Christ's crucifixion, for all we know. Because there are other parts of the Bible... In the Old Testament, particularly Isaiah chapter 53, where it's clear that that's the main thrust of what is recorded there. And Peter, in Acts uh, chapter 2, uh, verse 20, after Jesus' resurrection, the disciple Peter says that King David was a prophet who speaks of Jesus being the ultimate king to succeed him, who would one day come to save and lead God's people. 
So just so you know, at City Gates, we do believe in the gift of prophecy. The Bible's full of it. And we also believe in history. The life, crucifixion, and resurrection of Jesus Christ are among the most well-attested facts of history, both by Christians and non-Christians. We can read the evidence of eyewitnesses and the accounts of those who carefully sought out the facts from eyewitnesses and those who personally encountered Jesus both before and after his resurrection. Now, if all this is new to you, I recommend you read one or more of the accounts of Jesus' life written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John at the beginning of the New Testament. But as we look at this psalm, as David composed it, when he was led by the Holy Spirit, we see it's essentially in two parts. Verses 1 to 21 is a lament. David pours out his heart to God as he vividly describes his situation, his fears, and his complaint to God. Now, I think as Steve alluded to earlier, does this strike us as unusual? You see, how often do our prayers begin with a quick thank you, some praise, and then bang, we present our shopping list. Lord, please heal John. Please get Alice a good university place. Please give me some progress in that problem at work, and so on. Yet, what do we learn from the Psalms? You see, they're God's exemplars for our prayers, hymns, and our songs, and Yet, actually, if you do an analysis of it, approximately a third of the psalms include some form of significant lament. That is, the psalmist cries to God about his circumstances, complains, often bitterly, about how he feels and the emotional toll it's taking on him. So why don't a third of our songs and hymns and prayers present our laments to God? As evangelicals, we can be quick to say, well, God knows my situation and how I feel about it, so let's get down to asking him how to fix it. And sure, but God also knows all the requests we're going to make too. So why start with the list? Primarily, prayer is not a mechanism for ordering the specific things we want from God. Prayer is a medium for communicating our loving relationship with our Heavenly Father. And we need to come like a child to our father. You know, the way a child expresses love and dependence, you know, seeking attention and reassurance that, that God knows better than us. He knows how best to respond to the griefs and the problems we face. Let's let God be God in deciding how to care for us in whatever we're facing. We've recently been thinking about how we respond to suffering or trouble and we focused on the majesty of God kneeling to lament and depending on God for our future joy the last three Sundays this has been the very subject of the book of the prophet Habakkuk Alex summarized it well for us last week in three words behold kneel rejoice and if you miss these then do find the Habakkuk series on our YouTube channel because when we look at the structure of this whole psalm in a sense it's a mini Habakkuk Look at the sequence of alternating I and you passages. You saw it begin as Steve began to read for us. Starting with I in verses 1 to 2, it's about what's my problem. David sets out initial, his initial complaint. God seems far from him. And then in verses 3 to 5, David remembers that there's no situation that's beyond God's control. And we get that introduction to it yet you are enthroned as the holy one and he praises him for how he saved his people in the past we move down to verses six to eight and we get again but i david comes back and describes his circumstances in more detail how he's being treated nine to eleven he turns his focus to god again yet you brought me out of the womb he remembers how God has been with him personally all his life and explains to the Lord that he's got no other help. And then in verses 12 to 18, it's a list of me, I, my. David lists in great detail the specific dangers and the enemies he's facing, the physical, mental, spiritual impact all this is having on him. In fact, unlike us, you know, the, the bit about the request only really comes in verses 19 to 21. David then specifically pleads to God for, to deliver him from the threat of death. But note, he leaves the decision of how to intervene up to the Lord himself. 
David awaits God's will for the outcome of the situation. And then from verse 22 to verse 31, we switch to rejoice. We don't know in what way the Lord delivered David, but clearly he did. And here is an outpouring of praise and how David will lead God's people in praising the Lord because of his deliverance. David foresees the deliverance as having international and generational impacts far beyond his own people at that time in Israel. So having looked at this kind of outline of it, let's look specifically at the prophecy of the cross. Let's consider some of the Psalms' prophetic insights of the crucifixion. Well, of course, it begins with the words which Jesus cries out from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In verse 1. And that's recorded in both Matthew's and Mark's gospel accounts. In Mark chapter 15, we read, And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sambachthani, which means in Aramaic, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, an interesting thing here, you see, if we look back at the introduction to the psalm, what does it say? For the director of music, to the tune of the dough of the morning. Why don't we, now, you know, you all know the tune of the dough of the morning. Let's sing along. Anybody know the tune of the dough of the morning? Now, we've lost that in the mists of time, okay? The music wasn't written down for us. Just, we've just got the words. But what does it tell us? It tells us that this prayer is a song. Um, it's a part of the Old Testament hymn book, the Psalter. So it was regularly sung thousands of times between David writing it and Jesus saying these words from the cross. Now, the idea of numbering psalms is a relatively recent thing. In biblical times, you wouldn't say Psalm 22. To find a psalm, people would refer to it by its first line. So, for example, if I say to you, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, most of you can continue. Almost. It's got to be one of the most best known hymns of all, and I think we're struggling here tonight. So when Jesus says these words, he's drawing people's attention to the prophetic words of this psalm. He's saying, compare those words that you know from the psalm with the events happening right before your eyes and ears. And the disciples recognized the significance and they recorded it in the gospel accounts. Let's look at some of the prophetic statements. Verses 6 to 8. But I'm a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone despised by the people all who see me mock me they hurl insults shaking their heads he trusts in the lord they say let the lord rescue him let him deliver him since he delights in him jesus lives out the words of the psalm isaiah also wrote of him being despised and rejected treated as the lowest of men a worm by comparison with the men around him and in matthew 27 we read those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's a king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I'm the son of God. And Jesus is surrounded by his enemies, like wild animals ready to tear him apart. The Jewish ruling council, the religious authorities, and the crowds that they stirred up to call for his crucifixion. He pictures them as wild animals. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan. Powerful creatures encircle me. Roaring lions that tear their prey. They open their mouths wide against me. And on the cross, Jesus hangs. He's dehydrated. His bones have been dislocated. And he's in the depths of mental and emotional anguish. And he knows that he's about to face death. Verses 14 to 15, he says, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart's turned to wax. It's melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a pot's herd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. 
you lay me in the dust of death. And the Roman soldiers carrying out the execution are identified by the gospel writers. In verses 16 to 17, we read, Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. We see a vivid description of Jesus' naked, broken body on the cross, hanging by the nails hammered through his hands and his feet. And in verse 18, he says, They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. And in his account of the crucifixion, the Apostle John says how this strange detail of Psalm 22 actually happened. In John 19, he writes this, When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened so that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Now one interesting thing we read in Psalm 22, just as at the cross, notice there's no call for vengeance on the people that are doing this to Jesus. And in fact, on the cross, Jesus calls for their forgiveness instead. In Luke 23, we read that Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And as we read this psalm, we begin to understand the agony and the suffering that Jesus went through on that cross. But, and a big but, this is not some random act of evil or a miscarriage of justice against an innocent man. Jesus knew it was planned. It's in Psalm 22. And it's foretold here and elsewhere in our Bibles. So why did it have to happen? What's the reason for the cross? And here I'm speaking mainly to you if you're new to Christianity. Our Father God, though he's infinite, has made you and me to image him in his creation and to live in a loving personal relationship with him. He longs for us to walk closely with him throughout our lives, both in this world and beyond. Yet, of course, in our hearts, none of us actually wants to do that. Instead, we want to make ourselves God in our own eyes. We don't want him to guide us and tell us how to live. We're too self-centered. We crave autonomy to do whatever we want. We want to push the envelope a bit and break every boundary around us. We even jump God's safety fences around the cliff edge of our lives, don't we? Some think that this is the only life we have, so let's max out on everything we can get. Atheists say there's no God and live as if he's not there. Or else, if we're crafty, we invent a God that's in our image so we can excuse our bad thoughts, our bad words, and our bad deeds. And we tell ourselves that our selfish acts are not really that bad compared with other people we know. Yet we so easily still bring harm to ourselves and others, even those that we love. But you know, all that doesn't mean that God's not there. You can't just close your eyes, put like your fingers in your ears and go, no, 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 no. When we refuse and reject God, it's serious. We looked at it this morning, what the Bible calls sin. And make no mistake, if we insist on our own way, God will let us choose to live without him. But we need to be ready to face up to what we think we want. Jesus spoke about the reality of what happens at the end of our lives in this world. In John chapter 5, we read this, Jesus' words, Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves, that's the dead, will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. You see, Jesus tells us everyone will be raised up after death, whether you want to or not. And we'll face judgment about where we'll spend eternity. Either we'll enjoy eternal life with Jesus in the new heaven and earth that God will bring about at that time, or we'll be condemned to spend eternity in a state without God, the place the Bible calls hell. 
And for those of you who think, oh yeah, I've heard about all that hell stuff before. Do you know that Jesus speaks more about hell than anyone else in the Bible? In Luke chapter 12, he says this, but I, I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after your body has been killed has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. What he's saying, fear God. Jesus makes it clear that in effect, we can get what we may think we want. Do you understand that? We can get what we may think that we want. We can have an eternity without God. But it's in a final destination of darkness and continuous suffering in a place that's totally excluded from God's presence. Now, we have been seeing horrific evil around us in this world, particularly in the last few weeks. But have you ever wondered why it's not even worse than it is? Why is there not rampant evil all around us, even right here and now, continuous chaos and pain everywhere? Because in his mercy, God is restraining evil. In his grace, he limits what may happen in this present world, as bad as that seems. But imagine this world with no restraint on evil at all. And it may just begin to illustrate what hell will be like. So we have to ask ourselves, is that what we really want? And then we're left with a question, of course, but it's a very pertinent question for every one of us here. Why does God's judgment condemn people to hell? Why would God punish our sin in that way? Justice and purity, you see, is God's character. He's absolutely holy. He's absolutely infinite, absolutely other. He can't ignore sin. And everyone who sins faces God's just anger. Atheists like Richard Dawkins like to portray God's anger as somehow capricious. But what they've actually done is to invent a God in man's image. They mistakenly assume that God must be like us and God's anger must be like our anger, like he loses control and lashes out in a fit of pique like we might do. But the anger of God is altogether different from the anger of sinful humans. When God sees into the corrupt hearts of those like me and you who've rejected his righteousness, then his anger is his just, proportionate and settled response to sin. Now, we can understand a little something of just anger. For example, when we've been reading about or seeing on our TV the horrors which the warring factions have carried out against innocent women and children in Israel and Gaza and in the Ukraine, well, we, we look, don't we, to the judgment of some impartial just body, say the United Nations International Court of Justice at The Hague. We may be justly angry that innocent people have suffered and, and we rightly want those people to have justice and we would think a judge is corrupt who ignores their crimes or maybe pardons them without proper penalty so how can the pure holy righteous God ignore or pardon sin and more to the point how can we who have sinned escape such a terrible judgment how can God's justice be applied and satisfied the sentence must be carried out so, as Ray Parker Jr. once said, who are you going to call? We turn to the infinite love and agony of the cross. You see, what if, after passing the death sentence, the judge steps down from the bench and offers to take our place in the dock? That's what happened at the cross. In his great love, Jesus dealt with our sin. Because it doesn't take love to turn a blind eye or let someone off the hook. It's not loving if I ignore my children's bad behavior. But when two of them at different times had written off ca cars of mine, I learned in some small way that to forgive can be a costly act of love. But my understanding of sacrifice is nothing compared with the greatest self-sacrificial love. Jesus stood in my place and took the death penalty for me. Romans 5 puts it like this. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While I was still ignorant of God, in fact, rejecting and defying God, Jesus had already died for me, knowing that's how I was going to be. 
And in Romans 3, Paul writes, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Do you see what God's doing there? He's being just and at the same time providing a way for mercy so that he can justify those of us who need it. What do we need? We need faith in Christ. Though God is our judge, Jesus, who's both Son of God and Son of Man, became the sacrifice for us, faced the righteous judgment which we deserved instead of us. And Psalm 22 shows us something of the agony and the suffering he was to go through. It was so intense he felt separated from his father. Because Christ suffered hell itself in the place of every man, woman and child before and since so that we need never have to if we come to him for forgiveness. As the representative of all humankind, Jesus endured the cruelest physical brutal brutality that the Romans knew in the form of crucifixion. But also for the infinite son of God, as a famous preacher and writer J.I. Packer puts it, Jesus' chief sufferings were mental and spiritual. And what was packed into less than 400 minutes was an eternity of agony. Agony such that each minute was an eternity in itself. As, of course, mental sufferers know that individual minutes can be. Jesus suffered all this even though he knew that he was carrying out his father's will and pleasing him. In verses 19 to 21, we read Jesus is separated from his father, but he knows the father hears his cries, so he still calls out. He surrenders all his hope and trust to his father. Will his father deliver him? And in verse 22, like those films where at the climax, you know the screen fades and the next thing we see is many years have passed. What's happened? We, we want to know. Well, in Hebrews 2, verses 11 to 12, we, we read about the victory of the cross. The writer cites verse 22 and specifically identifies the narrator of that section as Christ, praising God the Father for his glorious victory to all God's people. How does it say it in the psalm? I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him, revere him, all you descendants of Israel. Jesus calls on all those who become Christ's brothers and sisters to praise God. These are the true descendants of Israel, the children who Jesus will save. Verse 24, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. Now we know that Jesus died on the cross, but it was not the end. The father didn't turn his face away. He did hear Jesus cry for help. On the third day, God raised Jesus from death and brought him to the throne of heaven. So that we read in verse 25 to 26, for from you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. The theme of Jesus is, of God's assembly is now that, that those who fear God will live forever because of the vows that Jesus fulfills. He promises that those who go to him shall be cared for in eternity and will praise God together with all his people. In John chapter 3, Jesus said, whoever believes in him, that's Jesus, God's own son, is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they've not believed in the name of God's one and only son. And in John chapter 5, Jesus told people questioning him, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged but has crossed over from death to life. If we want to have eternal life with Jesus, we need to trust Jesus' work on the cross to take away our sin. That's what the, tra the word translated believe in means here. And that's what every one of us has to do individually. We have to own up to our rejection of our Heavenly Father and our rebellion against him, turn away from our sin and come to Christ for forgiveness. But you notice know, something even greater than that? God says that once that happens, we'll be permanently adopted into God's family. We become true children of God our Father. We're heirs in his kingdom with our older brother Jesus, God the Son. 
in verses 27 to 28, all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will bow down before him, for dominion belongs to the Lord. And he rules over the nations. You see, God's people now come to him from all nations of the earth, because the whole world is his. And in verse 29, all the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. You see, only those who trust in the Lord can ultimately be saved to eternal life. We can't do it for ourselves. Now, I have to say, being saved to eternal life, is that you? If you've not yet trusted in Jesus for yourself, please let's talk about it before you leave tonight. I'm happy to answer further questions you may have. David wrote that as the centuries passed, this would be told to people who were yet to be born, people like you and me. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, declaring what? He has done it. Those final words of Psalm 22 foretell Jesus' final words from the cross. In John 19, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Salvation for all who will come to Jesus was accomplished at that moment. Now, as we finish, just a last word to my fellow Christians tonight. If you're suffering in some way, it's hard, isn't it? This psalm really speaks of our own laments. And we have to remember, how did the day of the cross end for Jesus? Well, he died. But then came the resurrection. In this life, we may suffer grief, hardship, pain, and disease. We may die younger than we expected or we would hope. Because we'll only know our full salvation after our death. But, Christian, Resurrection Sunday is coming for every one of God's children. Let's praise God. Let's pray.